Strike presents your hit parade, starring Frank Sinatra. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? Smile a while with Lorenzo Jones and his wife, Belle. Here's the Manhattan merry-go-round that brings you the bright side of life, that whirls you in music to all the big night spots of New York town, to hear the top songs of the week sung so clearly you can understand every word and sing them yourself. This is the Golden Age of Radio. I'm Dick Bertell, and tonight we'll take you on another audio excursion back to radio's formative years. You'll hear the programs that made the era golden and meet people who made those broadcasts a reality. The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertell is brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, serving Central Connecticut since 1889, and by WTIC. You'll meet our special guest after these words from Burrett. Buying a new car in 1972? If so, bank credit may cost you less. At Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, we offer low-cost, convenient auto loans. But we can do more than just put you on the road. We help you establish credit with a bank. We give you cash buyer leverage. And above all, you either start or continue a relationship with a large and progressive mutual savings bank. Once your credit is established, you may want to purchase a new home, improve your existing home, or take a personal loan to finance your trip across the country. Whatever your borrowing needs, it will pay you to start doing business with the Big B, Barrett Mutual Savings Bank. Once an established Barrett customer with good credit, you become a preferred Barrett borrower. So don't wait. Come into any office of the Big B, Barrett Mutual Savings Bank. Now to your host, Dick Bertel. Good evening, and with me once again is Ed Corcoran, the collector of old-time radio shows who, uh, in a very real sense, makes this program possible every month. Ed, we have uh, a guest tonight that is going to be familiar to, uh, I'm sure, every one of our female listeners and many of our male listeners as well. Yes, Dick. Uh, this woman holds the record for uh, being on the air in uh, afternoons. Serial, as they used to call him, uh, more than any other actress in her time. So that ought to give a, a clue right there who it might be. Well, of course, we're talking about Virginia Payne, who, uh, for the benefit of our listeners, might be more familiarly known as uh, Ma Perkins. <laughs> <laughs> You're lying. <laughs> uh, Virginia, it's good to have you here on the program. I look forward to uh, our having you as our guest for a long time. And... Uh, uh, we finally were able to get you because uh, you were appearing at uh, Stage West in Springfield, not very far from us, at the time that we uh, had this interview. Yes, that's right. Uh, they're in their fifth year, and they're like so many resident repertory theaters around the country, which have really endeared themselves to communities and which I think are serving a marvelous uh, purpose throughout the United States. Is your first love the stage, or might it be radio? Well, I suppose uh, my first love was the stage, but when radio came in, I thought this was such a marvelous theater of the imagination. And as Charles Eggleston, who played our shuffle on our program for a long time, he was an actor who celebrated 50 years in theatrical business, and he would always say, we mentally make up, and uh, which we really did. But we and the listeners... We all had a creative act involved, and I think that's what made radio, and particularly radio drama, such an exciting form. And our little myth... I received a, a letter once from Germany addressed to Miss Virginia Payne, Rushville Center, USA. <laughs> <laughs> and it reached me, which I think is a, is a triumph for the post office oh, department. Oh, I would think so. I would think but so. But this mythical lumberyard, you know, that never had a customer... Um, was as famous as any lumberyard, any business, I guess, in the country. Ma Perkins is what you're most remembered for, and Ma Perkins was uh, an elderly woman. As a matter of fact, she was 65 years old when the show started. Yes. And obviously you weren't, so I wonder how you could, <laughs> how, uh, being very young at the time, you were able to um, take down a part of a 65-year-old woman. I uh, think probably had I realized uh, how, how difficult it was, I'd have been 
more abashed than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Youth is a marvelous thing. I thought at that time I could play anything. <laughs> well, I guess you proved the point. You did get the part. You want to go into the background of it? I, I think it's uh, rather interesting. It was interesting. I was a, a young girl and still in school. And while, while I was still in high school and going to drama classes, they uh, I my home was in Cincinnati, Ohio, which... Uh, had a very large radio station, WLW. Yeah. You know, it was a really a pioneer mm -hmm. station. And at one time, it was a very powerful station. It had 500,000 watts until that was cut back by the Federal Communications Commission. They asked us if we would like to come down and do dramas. At about 11, 11.30 at night, we'd come down and do dramas. And, we, oh, we were thrilled. We thought this was very exciting. We'd do the sound effects ourselves. And we were paid in cab fare. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was great because I was, at that point, I was about 16 years old. And, um, you know, we really learned the medium. I, I learned microphones. I knew microphones and the distances and how one had to uh, perform. And I learned what you could do and what you couldn't and what the dangers were and hazards and so on. But I really knew this business when I was 18, 19 years old, so that when I went up for the uh, audition for this part, uh, I think possibly the people within the uh, circle at the station knew that it, it had chances of being a series. So the director had a girlfriend whom he had primed, and uh, the announcer had his wife in line, and they I think they'd all been coached on these scripts. And I, I, we each had a number, and I was number five on the audition. And, of course, they didn't see us. They listened in a control room, in a closed control room, and simply heard us. And the, the character at that point was supposed to be uh, modeled on Marie Dressler, a great character actress. And I did my version of it. And uh, then they'd say, well, number one and number five wait, and number two and number five wait, and... And we went down, you know, to the runner-up part of it. And finally they said, all right, number five. And uh, that was I. <laughs> and so <laughs> then the, then the came the, the thing of sustaining the character, of course. And uh, I had a very difficult director. We had a 16-week local tryout period. He'd say, you've lost it, you've lost it. And I'd say, well... I guess I have. You know, she was a 65-year-old woman, and I was way out over my head. There was no question to that. But I kept on working at it. We rehearsed at that time. We rehearsed about five hours a day for a 15-minute program. And eventually the uh, agency men came from Chicago, and one of the vice presidents, who was a very tough gentleman with whom I did much business and over the years that followed, but he said he finally said to this director, let her alone. She's all right. Direct some of these other people. <laughs> 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 so then I began to emerge. <laughs> well, Ed, you, you have an excerpt from uh, your collection, Vintage 1938. So let's hear how you sounded back in those early days, Ma. Up the dog on Ma Perkins, America's mother of the air. Brought to you by Procter & Gamble, makers of Oxidol. Oxidol laundry soap that's so important for summertime washing. Because of things like uh, sheer cotton prints, white shirts, and children's play suits that just won't stand up under scrubbing and boiling, if they're to last the summer out, you must get them clean without any harsh washing methods, as you know. So why not make a fair trial of Oxidol yourself? After all, a single trial will show you how to end scrubbing and slaving over a steaming washboard all summer long and have whiter, cleaner washes, too. Oxidol, spelled O-X-Y-D-O-L, in the famous orange and blue bullseye package. A single trial is all we ask. You yourself be the judge. And now for Ma Perkins. Well, Friday, you remember, Gregor met his wife, Sonia, at Ma's house, still believing that 11 years ago she betrayed him marked him for certain death as a traitor to his country. And when he suddenly came face to face with her in Ma's home, it took all Ma's ingenuity to save the situation, to convince Gregor that Sonia had come because she loved him, because of their child, and that he must listen to her because... But, listen. You, you mean to say that my old friend, Vladimir Nikolai, they've trailed me here to Rushfield Center? Sonia, 
Is that a fact? Yes. They hunted you everywhere. And they are here. Oh, but for the land's sake, you didn't tell me that, Sonia. Oh, I know, madame. So you see, Mrs. Perkins, I was right. She talks of loving, of suffering, of our son. She's only another one of her tricks. Sonia, is that true? No, no, I am not tricking, Gregor. Oh, I beg of you to believe me, Gregor. I would not hurt you again for all the world. Then why have you said nothing about them being here? Why? Explain it. If you tried to explain that you loved me, even when you betrayed me. What was your reason, Sonia? Why have you kept quiet about Vladimir and Nikolai? Because I, I knew that if Gregor found out... Yes? That I was afraid that you might flee. And that any chance of planning to save our boy would be gone. Oh, oh, I see, because of the boy. Yes? No, you lie, Sonia. You lie about that as you lied about everything. Ah, I don't even believe that we have a son. Oh, but Gregor, in the name of everything that is holy, I, I could not stand here and tell you such a thing if it was not true. Then why do you say you do not know where he is? Why do you keep on insisting that? Oh, Madame Perkins, what can I do with him? Now, Gregor, I think you have to listen to what she's got to say. You just have to. No, it's not so easy. Lies, that's all I had up to the day she left, Mrs. Perkins. Lies. Lies when she told me of her love as we planned for the future. All the time she was leading me to betrayal. But now, Gregor, if you can only listen and believe in me when I say... Believe you? When I think of the men you betrayed? The men you sent to death before a firing squad without a chance? Oh, Gregor, stop. No, oh, you don't like it, do you? Think of them, Trojanov, Petrovich, Vakulnevsky, Bakarin. Those names, you don't like to hear them, do you? Oh, please, Gregor, in heaven's name, stop it. Oh, you'll drive me out of my mind. Gregor, you're not being fair. You're not at all. Fair? Was she fair with me, Mrs. Perkins? Oh, land devotion, that ain't the question now. No, but it's like a burning fire inside of me. I don't care if it is or not. Anyone on this earth who's done wrong and then goes so far as to try and right that wrong... I can tell you they're well on the way to erasing the harm they did in the eyes of anyone decent. To erasing the wrong. What is done is done. No, it ain't done at all, and you know it. With me, it is done forever. Now, you came here with Nadia. Yes, yes only with Nadia. You say you found out I was here by that newspaper article of the trial. Yes, that is true. And through Vladimir and Nikolai, no? Through them, you may as well know. You said they were here in Rushville Center. They are here, yes. Do they know this meeting with me? Sonia, answer me. Land devotion. Sonia, do they? And if they do, does it matter now? Answer, Sonia, do they know? Oh, I am not sure, but I, I think they have followed me here. I see. Then you betrayed me again. No, no, Gregor, do not say such a thing. Oh, I plead with you. Let me go. Let me go, I say. Oh, my goodness, Gregor, don't hurt it like this. No, I'll never let you go. I will hold you here so close to my heart always. I see it all, Sonia. Let me go. No, my Gregor, never will you be away from me again. <laughs> She's hurt. Sonia. A shot fired through the window. Did Vladimir and Nikolai catch Gregor at last? And what was in Sonia's heart as she held her husband there? Who was hit by this sudden bullet from the dark? Was it Gregor or... Be sure to listen tomorrow. Until tomorrow then, this is Dick Wells saying goodbye. <laughs> Our guest is Virginia Payne here on the Golden Age of Radio, and uh, we're talking about that all-important show for you, Virginia, Ma Perkins. You played the part for 27 years, <laughs> and it was important because this was Procter & Gamble's first venture into radio. That's right, yes. My first word of encouragement came from a wonderful lady who's a famous lady, and I always like to pay tribute to her. One day, I came out of the studio, the page boy said, there's a lady here waiting for you and uh, uh, she said uh, I said yes and I went up and she said you don't really play Ma Perkins <laughs> do you and uh, I said as I said to you and Ed I spent most of my time those days backing out of rooms saying yes ma'am yes I'm sorry but I do yes ma'am because <laughs> I didn't look at it at all I was very disappointing to the people who believed in the character <laughs> and uh, well she said that's amazing she said, I've been listening to you. And she said, you probably have never heard of me, but my husband and I have been in vaudeville for years. And she said, we have a program that originates in Chicago called the Smackouts. 
Well, you know who I'm going to say. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and uh, she said, that I want to tell you something. You have a marvelous character there. She said, don't you change that character one iota. You have a million dollars in your pocket. And that was Marion Jordan. That's who right. Was, right. It was Molly oh, McGee. McGee and Molly. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but I thought that was so generous and sweet. Mm. And it was really the first kind word that was said to me. I never, fr- I loved, I loved Marion. And uh, they were so, so good when we first went to the network. They were so kind to me also. You're listening to The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertell. Brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, serving Central Connecticut since 1889. And by 1080 Radio, WTIC in Hartford. Burrett Mutual Savings Bank asks you this question. Why should you save? Burrett Mutual Savings Bank will also try to answer. The reasons for savings are almost endless. One, it can open the door to your new home. Two, it can give you the means to new furniture, a new car, a boat, a vacation. Three, it can help send your children to college. Four, it can give you that glorious feeling of independence and prosperity. Don't ever feel that you have to have large amounts to save. At Burrett, deposits as small as one dollar are welcome, really welcome. Start now and save for all these reasons and perhaps some of your own. If you can't save a lot, save a little. At Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, where deposits are safe and earn good dividends. Start your account tomorrow. Member FDIC. Now back to your host, Dick Bertell. Our guest tonight is Virginia Payne, and uh, we're recalling the wonderful days in her uh, radio career. Well, I wonder if you could do the the famous voice, uh, maybe giving us your impressions of uh, Hartford now that you're here. (laughs) (laughs) What a land of Goshen. Dick and Ed, I wish I could be here to see this station. This just beats anything we ever saw. Rushville Center has nothing like this. No, no, no not even Three Rivers that's near us. I, no, they have a pretty good radio station, but it's nothing like this. Or Uncle Ezra's, if you remember his. That was a nice little station. Mm-hmm. But, um, my goodness, this is, is simply beautiful. Oh, that's marvelous. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, let's, let's talk about the character of Ma Perkins. What is this accent? I, I, you know, usually, and I'm sure you can do this too, Virginia, you can spot somebody very quickly. You can say, well, this person's from the Midwest, that person's from New England or New York or whatever. Yes. But I have never been able to place Ma Perkins. Well, uh, she's a uh, Rushville Center, USA <laughs> lady. We tried to make it a, a rather universal uh, dialect and not, y- you know, something that would be considered folksy, rural America. Mm-hmm. It was that feeling of home, I, I believe, that we tried to create, uh, a feeling of home and an affirmation of life and the, the land and the things that really represented uh, that kind of full life. Uh, Abundance. And had a wonderful uh, question for you at lunch today, and, and uh, I've just got to ask it, and if you don't <laughs> mind, Ed. What did you do for publicity pictures? Here you were, <laughs> about 20 years of age, playing a part 65 <laughs> years of age. As a matter of fact, through the very early years, uh, because my face is full, as you can see, it was practically impossible to, uh, to make it look sunken and the age I should have been. It was, uh, I don't have that kind of face. So, um, for, for the very early years, they had a model pose for the pictures when they just used a picture. And then uh, I had a wig and a, a padded girdle and a whole uh, costume and uh, makeup. And it, when I did personal appearances, I did, I did it in those. Well, I was wondering, too, that uh, 26 years, and uh, during that time, uh, you suffered a, a broken leg, I believe. <laughs> yes. Yet, you never missed a broadcast. And once in England, uh, you were fog-bound, I believe. Yes, and, uh, it was my first vacation of any length of time, and um, I went to England and thought I'd allowed plenty of time to come back, but they grounded the con- constellations. You, you had been written out of the script, I b- uh, Yes, I was, mm-hmm. Ma was supposed to be on a vacation. And for two weeks and while, well, uh, so I was gone. And that was one of the first vacations I had, and I went far and fast, as you could see. So 
I then I couldn't get back. The constellations were grounded, and those the constellations were carrying say some sixty passengers, and they were trying to put on two and three on coming incoming flights. You know, it was very hard. So finally, uh, I was able to. I was about over Boston at the time of the first broadcast on CBS, and I was petrified. I didn't know what. Now I could think of all America being breathless and. Uh, probably my contract being canceled and myself being responsible for all the millions of people that were discommoded. I didn't know what would happen. But I'd cabled from Gander and said I I really couldn't make it. So the script had been tailored in such a way that I would come in on the very last page. And when they came to the last page, they changed it, and my son said, Ma... Oh, Ma, you're back. Don't say a word. Just stand there. <laughs> Let us look at you. And then, then they said, tune in tomorrow, at which time I got there. <laughs> you did, you did I manage to the get to the day. studio. Yes, I was there at the very end of the broadcast, and they all heaved a great sigh of relief, <laughs> as I did. They had you for the next day. <laughs> right, right. Virginia Payne is our guest. Virginia, you were so closely associated with the, the Ma Perkins soap opera for 27 years that uh, one tends to forget that you were a very busy actress at a very exciting time in the broadcasting field. How many shows a day would you do? I mean, I suppose I would usually do up to oh, 07 or 08, something like that. Three of those were the Ma Perkins broadcast because we would do a prior broadcast in the morning, a transcription, which was sent to uh, Hawaii. This is before... Hawaii was a state, of course, and to some remote stations in Canada and um, independent stations throughout the United States. And that prior transcription was six weeks in advance of where we were on the air scripts. Then uh, we would do the CBS broadcast at noontime, 12.15 uh, Central Time. And then uh, we would do the NBC one, at 2.15. But between that, I would play a German lady named Mama Schultz on a program called Today's Children that I did for Erna Phillips. Then uh, I had a long sequence in the Jack Armstrong program, which I played a lion tamer, which was fun. And we did two broadcasts of that. One went to the West Coast. And then we would do, I did innumerable other broadcasts. I did First Nighter and Grand Hotel and Lights Out and World's Great Novels and a program called Hot Copy, which was a mystery program, and um, uh, that Brewster Boy and Freedom of Opportunity and University Broadcasting Council and, well, you name it, I played it. All of these uh, shows were coming out of right, Chicago. Right, Would you like to hear a, an excerpt from the Jack Armstrong series again? Oh, yes, that's a fun, that was fun. I knew all those people well, of course, I played with them. All right. Ed, can you provide us? Yes, this is a new one, Dick, right, uh, right off the press, literally. Uh, it just came into circulation, and uh, I think you'll find Fidelity is very nice, as well as the storyline. Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong! Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Wave the flag for Hudson High, boys. Show them how we stand. Ever shall our team be champions, known throughout the land. Mm. With these, Breakfast of Champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong... The All-American Boy. A fleet of Moro war Vintas, paddled by hundreds of warriors, is coming down the jungle river in Mindanao to attack the Moro village of Catabongo, where Uncle Jim's schooner, the Spindrift, lies at anchor. But Jack Armstrong, Billy and Betty, and Uncle Jim are not on board the schooner. They are in Malua's Vinta with 20 warriors. They are intercepting the fleet several miles up the river from the village, for Malua hopes that the luminous dragon's eye ring will make the attacking Moros turn back. The primitive fleet has stopped while its leader, the Dato, forges ahead in his Vita to meet Malua. As the two crafts approach each other, each on the alert for treachery, Malua stands like a brown-skinned Viking at the prow of his Vita. And Jack and Billy and Uncle Jim sit in the middle of the narrow boat. Listen. 
look at that Vita come, Jack. She does everything but fly. Oh, but at that, I don't believe she's as fast as our Vita, Billy. I don't know. She's got more warriors in it. Oh, but she's a bigger and heavier boat, Billy. Look at all that fancy carved woodwork on her prow and gunnel. She looks faster than me. What do you think, Uncle Jim? I don't think she's quite as fast as our Vita, Billy. Her bamboo outriggers are heavier and thicker. That creates quite a drag in the water. Gosh, I hope you're right. We can't fight this whole fleet. And if that dragon's eye ring doesn't do all that Malua said it would, we're going to have to outdistance every Vita on this river. Oh, the Dada was stopping as Vita. Look, he's waiting for us to pull alongside. Oh, we're going to hit him. Oh, Roll or rhythm. I bet you we stop within a foot of their ball. Oh, look. Malua and the Dotto can shake hands if they want to. Ooh. I wonder if Malua has shown him the dragon's eye ring yet. No, Betty, he hasn't. I've been watching him closely. See how Malua has his finger doubled up in his fist so the ring won't show? Jumping crickets. Malua can't expect to scare off this whole fleet without the ring. He's probably saving it for a last resort, Billy. Well, he'd better hurry up and use it then. That Dotto is looking terribly angry at something. He's turned away from Malua. He signaled something to his crew. His warriors have grabbed their spears and shields again. Oh, they're getting ready to attack us. Sit down, Betty. Our men are ready. Look, half our men have dropped their paddles and picked up their shields and bolo. Uncle Jim, is there anything Jack and I can do to help? Yes, Billy. You can keep your head. Malio isn't through with that Dotto yet. Watch him. Look at them, Billy. They're facing each other. The Dotto's about to give the word to attack. He's reaching for his bolo now. Look at Malio, Jack. He's stretching out his hand. That's the hand with the ring on it. This is the showdown, Billy. Malu is going to flash that dragon's eye ring before the Dotto. Come on, come on, ring. Do your stuff. Look, the Dotto sees the ring. Look at that expression on his face. Well, he's standing like a frozen statue. Watch him, Billy. He's taking his hand off his bolo. But he isn't saying a word. The Dotto is talking now. Just listen to him. Gosh, it looks as though he's asking Malu all sorts of questions about the ring. Malu isn't saying a word. He's just holding that ring up where the Dotto can see it. Now you were saying something now. I wonder why he's pointing down the river. I'll bet you he's telling that Dotto to stay away from Carabongo. Look, the Dotto's getting angry again. But he doesn't look so cocksure. He's afraid of something about that ring. He's turning around now. Look, the men are putting away their spears. Hey, our men are putting away their weapons, too. Boy, that makes me feel a lot better. For a moment, I thought that we'd be in the middle of a first-class fight. Oh, we're not out of the woods yet, Billy. Look at the Dotto. He's pointing to us as he talks to Malua. There's something afoot. Maybe he wants Malua to give us up to him as prisoners. Oh, Malua would never do that, Betty. Would he, Uncle Jim? Malua would never betray us, Billy. I'd trust him anywhere. Oh, look, the Dotto is telling his boatman something. They're going to move away. There they go. Here comes Malua. Now we'll find out what's going on. Malua doesn't look too pleased, Jack. I'm afraid things haven't gone exactly right. Well, they haven't gone badly yet. At least we're not being attacked. Look, Jack, look over to the shore. Some of the Dotto's beaters are edging downstream. And they're doing the same thing on the other side of the river, too. We'll be cut off if we don't hurry. Malua sees those beaters, Betty. If it's a trap, he'll know it. Well, Malua, what's happened? Dotto go back to his beaters. I see him going back, but is he calling off the attack? He wait. Later, he go home. Maybe. What's he waiting for, Malua? Can he make up his mind? He wait for night time. He wait to see ring the shiny knight. Mm, so that's it. He doesn't quite believe it's the real dragon's eye ring. And so he wants to wait until dark to see if it'll really shine in the night. That's right, Uncle Jim. When he see shiny knight, he go home. Maybe. Jack and the others will be in a jam, won't they? If that dragon's eye ring fails to stop those moros. And that Pandita certainly has it in for Jack and Billy. He won't let them get away if he can help it. It's going to be a crucial time when night falls. So listen in, all of you, at the same time tomorrow for another exciting episode of the Luminous Dragon's Eye Ring with Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Have you tried Wheaties? They're whole wheat with all of the brand. This is Franklin McCormick saying goodbye until tomorrow for General Mills, makers of Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, who have just presented another episode of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Wheaties, the best breakfast food in the land. Wave the flag for Hudson High. Oh, it's good hearing the characters again. Betty and Billy Fairfield and, um, of course, Uncle Jim. Uncle Jim, right.
Mm-hmm. There's a great story that, that you tell about you and Betty, and, and you can recall the name of the actress, spending Christmas Day together. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Sarah Jane Wells played Betty for uh, the life of the broadcast. Very talented actress. And um, we always worked all holidays, and even those poor characters who were only in three or four times a year managed to work practically all the holidays because on these family shows they'd always have a family reunion on Decoration Day and Fourth of July and Labor Day and Christmas Day and Thanksgiving Day. Those were their specials. So that some poor fellow who hadn't been who hadn't heard of us, who hadn't worked at it for four or five months would suddenly receive a call saying, Will you please be here July fourth, you know, just when he'd made plans for his vacation, disappointed his family and all that. That was fine. But uh, on, this was on a particular Christmas day, which was a very bad, a very very bad weather in Chicago. And we met in the ladies' room and shared a ham sandwich for <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, turkey on the uh, on the radio with ham. Right. And the <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Things haven't changed very much, Virginia. No, it I'll stays that way, doesn't it? <laughs> it certainly does. Virginia, you were one of the instrumental forces in the founding of the. Um, Radio Actors Union, AFRA, the uh, American Federation of Radio Artists, now known as AFTRA because television has been added as well. Yes. Uh, when did that come about, and, and what was your role? I was one of the first members on the board in Chicago, and um, it was 1937 that it was organized. I was just one of many people interested in bringing some kind of stability into the broadcasting business. We had all kinds of variants with, within the employment. We had many people at that time. I'm sure it's hard for present-day performers to think of it, but we had people at that time, very fly-by-night operators who paid by personal check or didn't pay at all. And uh, people were never paid for rehearsal so that you would go down on speculation and do I believe one firm did 92 auditions one year, which were prepared auditions with uh, big orchestras and singers, and and they, you know, nobody was paid. You could spend most of your life preparing great auditions, which came to nothing. The the joke was that people came over and had an audition when they didn't have anything else to do that Mm -hmm. afternoon. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So that there were many abuses, and it um, it really brought, I think, a, a... stability and and uh, because the good operators the good the people who who were at the top of the business and who did operate in fair business practice weren't greatly affected by it they they paid i think in some cases possibly less than they'd paid before but we tried to institute some sort of sense of and also of weeding out people of bringing in people that were professional were very, because there was a very good, fine group of people at that point. I was in the Chicago group and the first group in the board there, and then it more or less sprang up simultaneously, I guess, in Chicago and Hollywood and New York through the early years. I remember I was a chairman of a membership committee, and I at one time I announced at a meeting that we now had 400 members, which was a big, exciting thing. Now it goes up to the <laughs> thousands, you know. Well, you, you were the uh, the president in nineteen fifty nine, nineteen sixty, during yes. a rather crucial time in this business. Yes, it was. Of course, that was into the going into the television. Well, television was fairly well established, and the radio was at its slow ebb. That was That's just about right. the last good yes. years. Yes, we tried to keep what seemed to be uh, the pattern for radio. However, the p- the picture was changing very definitely for radio at that point. Yeah, in and fact, uh, your show, that's when it left the air. That's that right, time. 1960. 19, mm-hmm. gee. You were president on one side, and you were losing your, uh, <laughs> your, your old friend on the other. It was yes, kind of true. a disastrous mm-hmm. time for mm-hmm. you in that respect, mm-hmm. wasn't it? Well, actually, Virginia, it was at about this time in, in your career, at this it's low ebb, so to speak, that you did a suspense program, which is rather outstanding. And this one features Elizabeth Lawrence, Rita Lloyd, and, of course, yourself as uh, Mrs. Stinson in a program called The Companion. This goes back to uh, November of 1959. And as they used to say, this is a tale well calculated to keep you in...
Mrs. Hughes? Yes. Miss Lloyd? That's right. Come right in. I'm sorry if I'm late. I couldn't get a taxi, so I took the bus. Oh, no. You didn't take any time at all. I got the impression you wanted me to get out here fast. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, you're a local girl, aren't you? Yes. Well, you must know my husband, Kent. You were both probably in high school at the same time. Yes, I remember him. He was a year ahead of me, but that was some time ago. Where is my room, Mrs. Hughes? Oh, uh, just on the hall there. I, I'd like you to meet my mother first. Your mother? I thought you were alone. Well, I'm, I might as well be. Poor Mama's been in a wheelchair ever since she had her stroke four years ago. Uh, this way, please. Here's Miss Lord, Mama. This is my mother, Mrs. Stinson. How do you do? How do you do? Did you say Miss Lord? That's right. Somehow I expected someone a bit older. May I unpack now, Mrs. Hughes? Oh, uh, oh yes, of course. It's at the end of the hall. Mrs. Stinson, are these your jewels? Yes. Why? If I were you, I wouldn't leave them out on the bureau. They're beautiful. They might get lost. Well, I hope you're satisfied, oh, Lois. Mama, don't act as if I were being selfish. I got her out here as much for you as for me. Mm, move the wheelchair closer to the window, Lois. Oh, did I ever complain before about Kent going off on his business trips? If you want the truth, yes. Oh, I may have complained a little. I never did anything about it. I can't stand it anymore, always being left alone. Not all alone, well, dear. Yes, I know. That. I know. I'm a cripple. I didn't say that, Mama. You don't have to look so reproachful. Each time Kent's gone off, it's, it's gotten worse. Not that he cares. He's gone away again and again without giving me a thought. Now, Lois Hughes, you stop being so dramatic. Kent's a fine person and a good husband, but he's got his job to do. Well, then he ought to change his job. I think he wants to travel doing whatever he does. Oh, oh you think I exaggerate, don't you? Well, all I want is for my husband to come back home every night. Is that so terrible? Does that make me a bad now, wife? Oh, now, baby. Mama never thought that. Did you ever think how lonely it is out here for me? Buried like this out in the country? I get scared, Mama, sometimes. And then you with your precious heirlooms lying around. Oh, they're memories, Lois. That's all I have. Yes, but what if someone tried to get in here while Kent was away? Well, people are still robbed, you know. Stop talking that way. Are you trying to frighten me? I'm trying to be sensible. Those jewels are a temptation to any man who wants to walk in and pick them up. Well, I, I've had some of those pieces since I was 16, Lois. That diamond brooch belonged to your great-grandmother. Yes, Mama, I know, but what good would they do you if they were stolen? Hmm. Well, even, even Miss Lord noticed how careless you are about oh, it. All, all right, all right. I, I, I don't want to argue about it. But I, I still don't see what that woman is going to do around I'm here. Careless. She doesn't do anything. She'll be here. That's all I hired her for. Who recommended her? Pe Peggy Martinson. She stayed with her when she was sick last year. Hmm. I, I don't like her. You only saw her for one minute. She's too cold. She looks right through you. If you don't mind, I think I'll just have my meals sent in here. The less I see of her, the easier I'll feel. <laughs> Want me to take your supper tray, Mama? Mm-hmm. Have you eaten? Oh, I just had some coffee. I'm too jumpy to eat. Well, this storm is enough to make anyone jumpy. Oh, listen to that rain. Listen, don't have a storm, Mama. It's Miss Lord. Why? What's she done? Oh, nothing, nothing. It, it's the way she acts, that's all. It's, well, it's what you said. She's, she's cold. I, I feel uncomfortable around her. What has she done? Nothing, nothing, really. Nothing at all. I... I didn't want her to do anything. I just wanted to feel safer with her, but I, I don't. She keeps staring at me in that cold way of hers. Well, then, for heaven's sakes, get rid of her. Call a taxi and have them come pick her up. Won't that look awfully, awfully funny? Well, what do you care? This is your house. Pay her for the day and get rid of her. Tell her you've changed your mind. I never should have called her. It's true. I do exaggerate. We don't really need anyone to... What's the matter? You want me to look up the number? There's no dial tone. Well, jiggle the hook. It's dead. Oh, it can't be. The storm isn't that bad yet. Maybe it's just this extension. Go use the one in the front hall. Yes. Yes, Mama. I'll be right back. <gasps> oh! Miss 
Miss Lord. I, I thought you were in your room. I was closing the living room windows. Good night, Mrs. Hughes. Child. The phone. The phone. She cut the main cord. <gasps> I almost caught her at it. Did, did she say she did it? No, I didn't ask. I was frightened. Besides, she'd gone to her room. Why should she do it? Why? Don't you see? Without the phone, we're helpless. She... Oh, she she wouldn't do anything, honey. Why, why people know she's why, here with who us. Who knows, Mama? Nobody. They, they do, too. The taxi driver. No, she took the bus. She walked up from Broad River. She, she said she couldn't get a taxi. What are we going to do? I'm going to talk to her, Mama. Anything's better than, than not knowing. Lois. Yes, Mama. Be careful, honey. Miss Lord, it's me, Mrs. Hughes. Smile Power, the kind of confident, contented countenance that comes from cash, salted away cash, in a Burrett Mutual Savings Bank at the highest legal savings bank interest rate. And you don't need a lot of money to do it. You can save a little. It's the constant, patient, every payday habit of saving that really counts. At the Big B, we love your small deposits. We know they grow for you and for us. Result, we will both have smile power. Plus, we help with our high interest rates paid to you on your savings. Burrett Mutual Savings Bank. Deposits insured to $20,000 by FDIC. Our guest tonight is Virginia Payne, and uh, we're recalling the wonderful days in her uh, radio career in which she played for 27 years, Ma Perkins. And uh, that, that brings to mind the fact, uh, Virginia, that Ma Perkins was the last soap opera to leave the air. This was in, I believe, 1960, November of 1960, when it's CBS made the decision, I guess, to uh, drop all of the uh, daytime dramatic shows. Wasn't that the reason it left the air? Yes, that's right. It must have been a, a sad time, a, a touching time for you and the uh, other actors who were on that program for so long. Yes, well, it was very interesting. The last scripts were built pretty much around the family itself, the people who had been regulars over long periods of time. And um, our last broadcast was 7,065. However, that, of course, didn't include repeats, which we had done of nearly all those. So if you put all that together, it's almost 15,000 broadcasts, I guess, uh, altogether. And... um, We've had so much now renewed interest from young people. There's so many young radio buffs, and when I've been, I've been touring in theater, and I've gone across the country and have talked to so many of them. And there, of course, they collect scripts and uh, recordings. We had been companions to three generations of women, particularly, and their grandmothers, the mothers, and and the young people listened to us. And it was lovely to know that young people were carrying on. That was actually the way I closed the story. We didn't end it. We simply did this grace around the Thanksgiving table and talked about the generations yet to come. So it pleases me very much that the young people are interested in taking it up again, and it seems as if we were a bit prophetic (laughs) that day in 1960. We've turned back the clock to yesterday to Ma's Thanksgiving dinner. The dining room table looks lovely. There's a high chair for the youngest member of the group, Gladys and Joe's daughter, Jess. Ma always likes to have the youngster sitting right at the big table with the grown-ups. At her right, Ma's put the place for Mrs. Halleck, Anushka's mother. On her left, she's put Junior. And next to him, the girl he's going to marry, sweet Anushka. At the other end of the table, Shuffle will sit with Gladys on his right and Heavy on his left. Willie and Tom are well placed so they can reach the children, and Faye will sit closest to the kitchen door. Let's 
join us. No, 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 please, let's hold it down and we'll speak. Uh, Paula, you find the place guide for your brother and your cousin? Jamie, darling, you let go follow us, Sam. sitting next to you. Jackie, Jackie, tie your napkin around your neck, honey. Willie, Willie, tie Jackie's napkin around his neck. And Jackie, remember what I told you about this? Oh, uh, Jackie, see me after dinner. If you've eaten everything on your plate and drunk all your milk, I'll meet you privately with an invention of my own. A pickle tree. Tom, honey, that ain't funny. You'll do it. Oh, let him, Abby. Thanksgiving comes but once a year. Now, where do I go? Uh, you're, you're over an extra shuffle, guys. Oh, thank you. Where's Ma? Uh, Ma's right here. Oh, All right, now, now, you kids remember what I told you about grace. You fold your hands and you bow your heads. And you try to think of everything that we give thanks for. Pickles, Jackie. <laughs> oh, Tom, please. <laughs> you need any help in there, Ma? Here I come. Oh, Here I am. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, dear. Uh, Jackie, now, now, here comes the grace, you children. Yes. So little fingers will kindly stay out of the salty nuts and the... Jackie, <laughs> likewise out of the pickles. <laughs> oh. I guess we're all here, Ma. Now, uh... Who says uh, the grace? The shuffle said it last year. Well, I was thinking maybe you would, Willie, if you don't mind. Me? Oh, what a wonderful <laughs> idea. You, Willie. Oh? Go ahead, Willie. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, we've got such a million things to say thanks for, I, I hardly know where to begin. But you know what's in my heart. First of all, here we are all home and together. Two years ago, Junior was still in the Air Force. We give thanks for the Air Force, but also for Junior being home. And also for the wonderful girl he's going to marry. We give thanks for these wonderful children. We give thanks for this food. For all of us being together. For the happiness which lies ahead. I was talking to Ma before, and Ma said it better than I could, so I'll use Ma's words. With the kids, with Junior and Anushka, we get this side of the world going on and on into the future. World without end. And what we leave undone will be done by our kids. And their kids. I give thanks for that because I left so many things undone myself. But maybe my boy Junior will do them. He's a college man. And so, we give thanks. Amen. 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 I look around the table at my loved ones, and to me the table stretches on and on. Over beyond the other end, past shuttle, I see faces somehow familiar, though yet unborn, except in the mind of God. Table laden with the fruits of this good greener table set before the Lord, peace and happiness on every smiling face and in every innocent heart, the strong young men and the pretty young women. <laughs> Someday your family will be sitting here where I'm sitting, or Evie, or Paulette, or Jean, or Anushka's child. They'll move up into my place, and I'll be gone, but I find right and peace in that knowledge. Like the great swing of what they say about the stars in heaven. Revolving and returning to the place of the beginning. Time without end. Forever. I give thanks that I've been given this gift of life. This gift of time. To play my little part in it. Here's Ma again. Thank you, Dan. This is our broadcast number 7065. I first came here on December 4th, 1933. Thank you for all being so loyal to us these 27 years. The part of Willie has been played right from the beginning by Murray Forbes. Shuffle was played for 25 years by Charles Eggleston, and for the last two years by Edwin Wolfe, who was also our director. The fairy you have been hearing these past few years has been Margaret Draper, and the part was played for many years by Rita Ascot. For 15 years, our Evie has been Kay Campbell. Helen Lewis plays Gladys, and Tom Wells has been played by both John Larkin and Casey Allen. Our announcer is Dan Donaldson. 
Our writer for more than 20 years has been Oren Tavroff. Ma Perkins has always been played by me, Virginia Payne. If you care to write to me, Ma Perkins, I'll try to answer you. Goodbye, and may God bless you. Well, Virginia, that's the uh, really the close of an era with that broadcast. It was so historic. Do you miss it? Yes, I, I miss the people, and um, of course I miss the contact with those thousands of listeners. I'm always amazed at the power of broadcasting, and it seems to me that every place I've gone, I went all over the United States last year and up through Canada on the theater tour, and every place... We had friends, and it brings me back to something that happened when I was quite a young girl. There was an old actor who came out to WLW when I was just starting, and he stood just transfixed in front of that microphone. And he said, all these years, he said, my voice has gone out to four walls, and now it goes to four winds. And I've never quite got over the marvel of broadcasting, the miracle and to think that by dint of our voices alone, we were able to go into the homes of all those millions of people and th- that they grew my Perkins roses and sent in for box tops for offers and things like that and remained our friends over this many years. I'm deeply grateful. Virginia Payne, we're deeply grateful that you were our guest tonight here on the Golden Age of Radio. This is Dick Bertell. This is Ed Corcoran. Good night. The Golden Age of Radio with Dick Bertell and the recordings of Ed Corcoran has been brought to you by Burrett Mutual Savings Bank, serving central Connecticut since 1889. With the engineering and technical assistance of Bob Shurego, the Golden Age of Radio is produced and edited by Brian Hartnett. This is Norm Peters. Cigarettes present Benny Goodman Swing School, the Tuesday evening rally of everybody everywhere who gets a lift from the new pulsating music of youth, Swing. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Rita Hayworth and Charles Corbin in This Love of Ours. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. The makers of Instant Chase and Sanborn Coffee present the Charlie McCarthy Show. <laughs> This is Ken Carpenter, ladies and gentlemen, greeting you from Hollywood, California. On behalf of Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Mortimer Stern, Don Amici, and Marsha Hunt, and the Bickersons by Bill Rapp. <laughs>